ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the DLA Piper 16th Global Real Estate Summit. The presentation will now be turned over to John Sullivan, Global Co-Chair Real Estate, DLA Piper. Good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are. It, it's late evening, I know, for those of you in Asia who are with us. And welcome to the DLA Piper 2021 Global Real Estate Summit. Um, as you just heard, my name is John Sullivan. I'm the chair of our U.S. real estate practice, and I'm the co-chair of our global real estate practice here at DLA. And on behalf of uh, our 500-plus real estate lawyers around the globe, including uh, Rich Clowder and Barbara Trachtenberg, who are the co-vice uh, chairs of the U.S. real estate practice group, and Paul Shadle, who's a partner in our Chicago office and will host our panel in a little bit. We are absolutely delighted to have you joining us today. We are sure this is going to be a very interesting and insightful program. Um, it's, been a, it's been a challenging time for our world, for our country, uh, for our industry. But as you all know, it's always the case that challenge brings opportunity for those who are able to figure out a way to see around the corner, spot the trend, adjust, and adapt. We'll be joined in a few minutes by David Rubenstein, and, um, and David, as some of you may know, is a great admirer of President Lincoln. Um, and President Lincoln once said, and I will quote, I'm a firm believer in the people. Given the truth, they can be depended upon to meet any crisis. The great point is bring them the facts, end quote. So the aim of today's program is we want to serve up some facts. Um, to all of you, along importantly with wisdom and insight from some of the business world's leading investors. This is our 16th Global Real Estate Summit, but our first virtual Global Real Estate Summit. A lot of you have been our clients and our friends for years, some of you for decades and some of you for many decades. And we want you to know that we, we, you know, we believe that life is about relationships. We're in a relationship business. We truly value those relationships. We miss seeing you uh, in person. And we look forward to the day, which we think will be very soon, when we will be next to you. So to start us off, I'm going to hand it over to my partner, Frank Ryan. Frank is our America's chair, our Cobal Glow chair, and our co global co-CEO. So Frank, I'm going to hand it over to you. Thank you so much, John. Uh, and I, I really appreciate, John, you setting the tone for all those who will be attending and who are attending today. Uh, we should expect this to be a very insightful and informative uh, uh, summit. And I think it's an opportunity to help uh, you make your business decisions and think about how we can build and grow and strengthen our business in this industry. Uh, as industry leaders, 2020 imposed great challenges on all of us, leading teams through a pandemic, adjusting and pivoting to meet economic, governmental, and market demands, all while using Zoom, which is a Hollywood Squares type communication tool, created great challenges. Yet here we are uh, meeting again the challenges of the marketplace and our clients, as John said, and I'm very proud of our global real estate practice. It is really one of the finest in the world, led by John and others. Uh, our lawyers did not suddenly think during the pandemic that we should be presenting trends and forecasts to the industry. This is something we've been committed to doing for many, many years. And I'm really excited that all of you were able to join us in the summit today and listen to all the great leaders and business people in the real estate industry that can help you think around the corner and understand how to manage and consider the relevance and applicability of this global crisis. This summit uh, provides an opportunity for us to get together to talk about what's happening in the industry, to think about where the industry is going, um, and also, of course, to discuss how we should be adapting in the real estate space. And also, of course, considering and appreciating the health, safety, and well being of our communities. So I hope you have a tremendous conference. I know we have great leaders uh, in the business side and at our firm that will help navigate through many of the difficult issues that, that uh, people and clients are facing. And I want to offer our, our great support to John and the team, and thank you all for joining the summit. Thank you so much. Thanks very much, Frank. Um, just before we begin, I want to take a brief moment 
to thank a, a few people who've worked really hard to put this program together. Barbara Trachtenberg, Paul Shadle, Jay Epstein, Kathleen Jenowick, Joy Carlson, Liz McKean, Susan Garrity, and Chris Dellis Armas. I can assure you that but for their efforts, we wouldn't be here right now. So thank you to all of them. In conjunction with today's program, we're releasing the DLA Piper 2021 Annual State of the Market Survey. This is a survey that was taken between February 2-2 and March 2-2. It highlights how real estate industry leaders view the current state of the market and its attendant risks and opportunities. So you have all either received or you're going to receive uh, a link that will take you to the actual survey. I urge you to have a look at it. It's got a lot of interesting information. I'm gonna give you just a, a few quick highlights of the survey and then we're gonna get on with our program. So to start at a macro level, um, this year's survey reflects a significant positive shift in sentiment over last year's survey when, as, as you would expect, most respondents were in a bearish frame of mind uh, given what was going on in the world. Uh, last year. So in this year's survey, 74% of the respondents identified themselves as bullish about the upcoming 12 months for commercial real estate. So that's up from 21% uh, that were bullish last year. And interestingly, it's on par with our pre-pandemic um, survey in, in 2019. Uh, what were the most frequently cited reasons for this optimism? Um, probably no surprises here. The rollout of the COVID-19 vaccine and attendant opening up of economies uh, and an ample amount of equity and debt capital uh, in the market. Uh, interestingly, I think with respect to our survey, the predictions about the growth of GDP have turned out to be um, more conservative than has actually happened. Only 18% of our respondents thought that US GDP would return to pre-pandemic levels um, within the next six to 12 months. But we all saw the Commerce Department report last week, so you know that US GDP uh, grew at a 6.4% seasonally adjusted rate from January through March of this year. So it is uh, within spitting distance of the pre-pandemic uh, peak in late 2019. When our survey respondents were asked uh, what factors are likely to be most impactful to commercial real estate over the next 12 months, 86% identified e-commerce. So that's almost identical to the result that we got uh, in our prior survey. And uh, consistent with, with that finding, I suppose, 61% um, of our respondents identified logistics as presenting one of the most attractive investment opportunities for commercial real estate in the next year, followed by life science related real estate. Again, probably no surprise to the people listening to this program. The survey you will see when you look at it uh, also shows uh, people thinking that there are signs of recovery on the horizon for um, multifamily, housing, and uh, even uh, the hotel and lodging industry. And, one of our keynote speakers uh, may have something to say to us about that shortly, so, so we'll see. You, you will see when you look at the survey with respect to uh, which US cities were identified as being attractive for investment that Austin, Texas topped the list, Nashville was second, Raleigh, Durham was third, uh, Denver and Charlotte uh, tied for fourth place. So I think those are interesting results. Uh, Miami and Phoenix, two markets that actually experienced some growth during the pandemic, saw a significant increase in attractiveness over our prior survey. And with respect to non-US cities, London was at the top of the list. So again, I would urge you to take a look at the, at the survey. Uh, it does have a lot of interesting information. If you have questions on it, you can feel free to reach out um, outside of this program to myself or Barbara Trachtenberg or Paul Shadle our contact infos on the back of the survey. Okay, so let's get to the real reason why you all tuned in today, and it's to hear from our speakers and our panelists. And we start off with two true icons, David Rubenstein and Jonathan Gray. So if you're like me, um, you're old enough to remember that there was once a brokerage firm called EF Hutton, and they would run a commercial where they would, they would use this tagline. Their tagline was, when E.F. Hutton speaks, people listen. 
And for some reason, I, that popped into my head when I was thinking about the fact that we have David Rubenstein and Jonathan Gray talking to us today, because when David Rubenstein and Jonathan Gray speak, people listen. Um, I'm going to hand it over to David in just a second. Uh, David Rubenstein truly needs no introduction. He's the co-founder and co-executive chairman of the Carlisle Group, one of the largest and most successful private equity investment firms on the planet. He's an author. He's a television show host. He's a leader in philanthropy. And if you've met David, read his books, uh, heard him speak or seen him on TV, you know and appreciate that he views the world through a very wide lens and has a deep understanding um, not only of, of business, but of history, of ge geopolitics and human nature. So it is my absolute privilege and pleasure to uh, turn it over to David Rubenstein. So David, over to you. Thank you very much for that kind introduction, overly generous. Um, I hope I can invite you to give my eulogy at some point because uh, the introduction was better than it deserved to be. I would also say the one thing you left out is that I'm a very satisfied client of DLA Piper. Um, some of my former law partners are there, Jay Epstein and Fred Klein. And uh, they've been very helpful to me and also uh, at our, my family office. So thank you for your services. We're very pleased today to have Jonathan Gray with us. Uh, Jonathan Gray is also somebody that probably needs very little introduction, but I just want to tell you a few things about him and then I'll get into some questions. Jonathan Gray is a person who uh, is now the president and chief operating officer of Blackstone, which is the largest private equity firm in the world and which has done quite well recently, and I'll talk about that in a moment with Jonathan. Uh, Jonathan uh, joined Blackstone right out of uh, the University of Pennsylvania, where he got a degree from Arts and Sciences and also from Wharton. He's a graduate of, of Penn and, and as a Phi Beta Kappa graduate. Um, he joined in 1992, and then he rose up and became the co-head of real estate in, at Blackstone in 2005. 2011 became the global head of, of real estate at Blackstone, and 2018 became the president and chief operating officer of the firm, which has done quite well under his leadership. Uh, he is a native of the Chicago area, and I would say also a committed philanthropist involved in many different areas we'll talk about in philanthropy. So, Jonathan, thank you very much for giving us this time today. David, thanks for having me. Thanks to DLA Piper for organizing this. It is an honor, by the way, to be interviewed by you the best. Okay, well, I hope you'll say that at the end. But uh, Jonathan, um, you had a blowout quarter uh, in, in the first quarter this, uh, this, this year. Um, earnings were greater than ever, beaten expectations. Um, your assets under management grew to a record high. Why don't you just step down right now? You can't do any better than you just did in the first quarter and just say, look, you're retiring it at your very young age and uh, you know, just live off your laurels. Why don't you just step down now? You can't do better. Is that right? And that's the way it works. Like Ted Williams, you hit a home run, you walk off. Um, so I'd say a couple things on that. Uh, first off, uh, I don't want to stop because I love my job. I get to work at this firm with so many talented people who care a ton, who are super smart, who work really hard. And that's a lot of fun to be around that kind of energy and creativity. And also, the job itself, the intellectual challenge, as you know, as an investor, is, is also a lot of fun. Thinking about one day, should we buy a movie studio in Hollywood? The next day, thinking about a pharmaceutical company in Japan or warehouses in Brussels. You know, the intellectual challenge of doing this and thinking about the world and all the factors, the people you meet along the way, all of that is also very special. And so I would say, one, I love my job. And, and the second thing I'd say is, although we had you know, a couple of very good quarters, I think about the business over a much longer time period. And what gets me excited is that the business that we've both plied our craft in here for a long time, you more than me, but has tremendous tailwind. So if you look at alternatives today, there are $7 trillion in private real estate and private credit private equity, infrastructure, but that compares to $250 trillion in liquid markets, in stocks and bonds. And we're in a low rate environment, people are looking for returns. So we think we're gonna see a lot more capital coming, not only from traditional pension funds and sovereign wealth funds, but from insurance companies and individual investors. And at Blackstone, because we have such a broad platform, we've had such good performance, 
We have this strong brand. We continue to see a lot of strength in the business. So I love the job and we have a lot of momentum and I feel like the future's bright. So I'm gonna keep playing ball, I guess is the short answer. Okay, well, I'm sure your shareholders are happy with that. But let me ask you why it is that, that the private equity world, all the private equity firms have done, that are publicly traded seem to have done well and the non-publicly traded ones seem to have done well also. Why did they during the pandemic do so well when, when the economy was shut down for a while and when it was difficult for people to work in their offices? Why did the private equity firms do so well? Well, what ended up happening, which was obviously a, a bit of a surprise, was a couple of things. First, um, governments moved very fast, much faster than they did in the previous crisis. And their moves fiscally to provide stimulus and their moves monetarily to lower rates and start buying bonds really put a floor under the economy, but even more so a floor under valuations. And obviously, as owners of lots of assets, when valuations go up, that's helpful for our business. The second thing that happened, um, which I think is more fundamental, is we've been, as a global economy, slowly transitioning from sort of a physical world to a digital world over the last 10 or 15 years. And what the pandemic did was it put things on this sort of upward slope very quickly. And we moved to you know, we shopped online, but we started shopping a lot more, streaming movies and music, actually going to the doctor, dating, gambling. And so if you had exposure to the technology world, the largest cap stocks, or if you own companies like we did, like Bumble or Ancestry, or our biggest holding, I was listening to the survey with interest in real estate is logistics, and that's benefited from e-commerce, you saw big increases in value despite the pandemic. So it was a combination of the policy that we saw as well as the strength in technology. And now, of course, we're seeing this recovery in the real economy and all of that's led to higher values. And so if you're an asset manager, particularly exposed in the strong technology areas, you've seen a lot of growth in value. Well, what about the, uh, the stimulus, which is really helping the economy of the United States? Uh, at some point, it's going to wear off. And at some point, uh, interest rates will go up. Does that worry you that ultimately the, the help that the federal government has given will kind of uh, wear off and we'll have a much lower growth economy? Is that something you're concerned with? You know, my concern, I would say, is almost the opposite in the sense, as opposed to sort of a petering out of economic activity, I'm worried about an overheating. Because what's happened here is, if you think of the economy as, as sort of this river of commerce that's flowing, that was impeded by the pandemic. You know, we weren't able to travel, we weren't able to shop, we weren't able to go to a wedding, we just couldn't spend. And now these vaccines are coming along and that the dam of the pandemic is going to go away, certainly in the US and UK here fairly quickly. And on the other side of this, you have tremendous savings that have built up, this huge stimulus, and we all have cabin fever. You and I were talking beforehand, anxious to travel again. Everybody feels this way. And so what I think you're gonna see is a almost like a torrent of economic activity coming through. And, and what we are gonna see and we're beginning to see is real inflation. And so we're seeing it in commodity prices, um, obviously energy prices, uh, used cars are up 25%, home prices are up 15 plus percent. And my concern is we'll see bottlenecks, wages are gonna go up, which is obviously helpful, but if the overall pricing level goes up too much, then the concern becomes inflation, it becomes higher rates, that could have an impact on the markets and the economy. So I'm concerned, but less about things sort of slowing down too quickly, more about them heating up too quickly. Okay, well, uh, what about uh, what is going on in the area that I'm in now, in Washington, D.C.? There's a proposal by President Biden to have an infrastructure um, uh, bill, which is going to be very significant, but he wants to pay for it by increased corporate taxes, individual taxes, and also to eliminate uh, carried interest. Uh, are those ta potential tax increases of concern to you? Well, I'd Start by saying I think the administration has the right priorities, uh, which are investing in infrastructure, something that on a bipartisan basis, people recognize we haven't done enough of over time. I also think investing in our social safety net for low and middle income families is a good idea. 
but it does create challenges, the balance of, you know, you need some revenue, how do you get that? And so in my mind, it's really a question of extent, uh, particularly I would say in certain regions where you have um, much larger governments, much larger taxes. So if you think about New York City, where I'm sitting in, where you have a 15% tax rate, my concern is if you take capital gains rates up, um, you know, into the low 40s uh, and you cumulatively are at 60%, will you see people change their behavior in a way that um, impairs capital formation? Will you see people migrate to other locations? Um, my guess is at the end of the day uh, that there will be tax increases, probably not as high, and that there'll be negotiations and there'll be some tax increases, but lower than probably originally proposed. Okay, and uh, let's talk about the pandemic. Uh, what surprised you uh, about uh, Blackstone's performance during the pandemic and what surprised you about Blackstone and what did you learn about yourself? In other words, uh, you've been at Blackstone since 90, 1992. Uh, you knew the firm pretty well. What surprised you about its performance, good or bad, during the pandemic? And what did you learn about yourself during the pandemic? So I think in terms of the firm, um, I wasn't surprised that we weathered the storm because sure the funds we have, long-term capital uh, reserves, we could get through it. Um, I guess surprised just how well our people performed, particularly during the intensity of March and April last year, how committed they were, even when we couldn't be physically together. Um, everybody was all in. Everybody understood the importance of the mission of delivering for our customers. And the combination of sort of how the business is structured and how well our people performed, that turned out exceedingly well. And you see that in the financial results. So um, that was clearly a positive. For me individually, um, I'd say on a professional basis, it, it reaffirmed for me how much I like being around people. You know, for those, I started coming back to the office in July, but for those three months, I was by myself at home basically. Um, not being able to physically be with people and sitting in front of the Zoom screen all day, I found pretty frustrating. And it, it made me uh, try to create ways to connect more with our organization. We created something we call Blackstone TV, which is not nearly as good, David, as what you do. But every Monday we host a show, myself and Steve Schwarzman and other leaders of the firm talk about what we're doing in order to connect with our people. By the way, we have a photo contest You'll be happy to know Byron Wien won this week for his 1950 yearbook high school graduation picture uh, from Sten High School in Chicago. But I really, I think what I realized is I had a need to connect, people had a need to connect, and that became a big priority. And then I would say on the personal side, besides getting to spend a lot of time with my family, my wife and daughters, which was special, very special, um, we got a COVID dog, which I did not anticipate, I fought hard, and I love that dog so much. Do not tell my wife and daughters, but I love our dog. Okay, so let me ask you about the issue that, that people like you are now facing. What do you do with your employees? Um, do you say you have to come back um, and we want you back by a certain date? And I think JP Morgan has publicly said that they want their employees back relatively soon. What's your position on what your employees should do? You want them back five days a week? And when they come back, do you want them to be, or do they have to be vaccinated? So what I would say is we believe that we're much better together. That as a firm, uh, we don't have the secret formula to Coca-Cola. What we have is a lot of very talented people and the culture that glues them together. And if we lose that, that really creates a long-term risk to the business and that this technology, which is very helpful and we'll still utilize, is not a replacement. We've hired 700 people since the pandemic started, many of whom haven't been in offices. It's hard to build relationships, to build trust, to understand how others operate. It's hard to have the kind of creativity that comes from going into a conference room. So we have a strong bias when it's safe to do so to get people back. As I mentioned, we started bringing people back really uh, investment professionals back in September 
on a voluntary basis. We tested people twice a week. We had contact tracing. We paid for transportation and a portion of our people came back. As we get vaccinated, I would expect we're gonna go back to working in the office. Uh, the vast majority of the people, that would be my expectation. There may be some role for certain functions with some flexibility, but our bias will be together because I think that's the way we serve our clients in the best way. Speaking of your offices, it's been reported that you uh, are opening an office in Israel and you're opening uh, a supports facility, I think in Miami. Uh, can you comment on why you're doing that? So each of these are different. Uh, we have as a firm been investing increasingly in faster growing industries over the last few years um, in the growth space, fast growing larger size companies and private equity, tactical opportunities. And Israel today uh, is one of the most dynamic places in the world for some of these emerging technology companies, particularly in the cyber space. And so we want to be close to where the companies are we hired a really talented executive there, uh, and we wanted to say, look, we can access more deal flow there closer to the source. In Miami, it's a story of technology also, but there it's for our internal technology people. We wanted to broaden where we could access more technology talent, ideally get more diverse talent. We thought Miami would be a great spot. It was a decision we had made prior to the pandemic, and we think we'll be able to, we've already begun to attract really great talent. And so as our firm grows, getting closer to the talent, getting closer to the opportunities matters. New York City continues to be our hub. Obviously London for Europe, we're more spread out in Asia, although Hong Kong's our main hub there. But I, I just think we need to attract the best talent where they're located and that's where we have our offices. Okay. Now, let me ask you, uh, you went to the University of Pennsylvania, as I mentioned, and you went and got a degree from the arts and sciences part of Penn and also Wharton. Why couldn't you decide which one you wanted? Why did you get two, two degrees or two parts of, of, of uh, Penn? So um, it was the best decision, by the way, I made for a bunch of reasons. But I went to Penn as in, I thought I was going to be an English major. I ended up being an English major in the college. I thought I was going to write for the New York Times. I wrote for the Daily Pennsylvanian. Uh, I was mostly on the women's sports beat covering gymnastics and softball. Um, and at some point, uh, really in the beginning of my sophomore year, I realized I like stocks. I like numbers. I had a bunch of friends who were in Wharton, and I decided I'd get a dual degree. And that turned out to be, as I said, the best decision I could have made because in romantic poetry, I met this amazing woman, and uh, that turned out to be the best decision I made in my life, my wife, Mindy, who you've met. And a few weeks after that, I got a job interviewing on-campus recruiting for a very small investment advisory firm called Blackstone. And here we are nearly 30 years later. I'm with the same woman. Uh, we have four daughters ourselves, and I have the same job. So. I often say luck is a core competency for me. Well, when you joined Blackstone, were you in the advisory business? Did you go into private equity? You were not in real estate initially, is that right? There, there was no real estate. I was mostly in the ordering dinner and making pitch books business primarily, because when you showed up back then, there weren't big staffs of people. And when you were the new analyst and we just had a couple of us, you had to take turns ordering dinner for all the associates and vice presidents and then get the food and bring it to people. That was my job, making pitch books, running numbers. I was working on, at the time, M&A um, and private equity deals. We were a very small firm. We had about 80 people. The only good news was that we were only about half, maybe two thirds of the floor. And the balance of the floor I didn't have to order dinner for was a small liquid firm called BlackRock. BlackRock, our affiliate. So think about that. When I joined the firm, the two largest, largest alternative asset manager and liquid asset manager in the world were sharing one, one floor at the time. And so I just started doing, you know, what you do as an analyst learning. And about a year into things, the real estate market had collapsed. And Steve Schwarzman and Pete Peterson, the co-founders of Blackstone, had this great idea to say we should go into real estate. 
they found an immensely talented and wonderful person in John Schreiber, who's based in Chicago, experienced real estate investor. They formed a joint venture and they said, well, gosh, there's nobody here to help. Somebody said to me, why don't you go help this guy uh, with this business? And this is where I say luck, I've been very fortunate. And so I got to get in on the ground floor of what would grow to be the largest real estate business in the world. But at the time it was tiny and back then, the first deal I worked on was a $6 million shopping center. Today, the legal fees, DLA Piper can appreciate this on some of the deals are bigger than the deal sizes were back then when I started. Well, let's talk about uh, two real estate deals that you did that uh, made a lot of real estate history. One was the EOP transaction. Um, you negotiated a deal before the uh, Great Recession to buy at the highest price ever paid a large real estate uh, uh, publicly traded company that Sam Zell had put together, but then you pre-sold a lot of the assets. So if it was such a great deal, why did you want to pre-sell all the assets? And if you hadn't pre-sold it, would that deal have uh, survived? If I hadn't pre-sold it, I probably would not be here talking to you, David. Um, what I would say is, I, I'm, maybe I'll go back a little bit to put some context on this, which is our real estate business grew up like a lot of firms did in the 90s, buying distressed assets, riding that economic recovery. Um, and then after 9-11, Alan Greenspan, the, the Fed chair at the time, cut rates pretty dramatically. And uh, real estate started going up in value. We started you know, trying to find ways we could buy things attractively. There wasn't much distress. But the commercial mortgage-backed securities market started to take off, liquid real estate debt. And we figured out that we could take this liquid real estate debt and use it to buy public companies that owned real estate because the real estate in the public companies traded more cheaply on the screen than it did out on the street. And that started a whole series of public companies which crescendoed with EOP and then Hilton. And EOP, we were in a bidding war, $39 billion. Um, Sam Zell timed it perfectly. But we had a view that there was a spread between sort of the wholesale buy of this company and the retail basis we could sell it off at. And as the bidding war ensued from when we first struck the deal, I went to Sam and said, look, I can't pay anymore. We were planning to sell a third of the assets. I need to sell more. And it was like transfer pricing. So if I can get more from downstream buyers, Sam, I can pay you and your shareholders more. He smartly agreed to that. We started. Um, selling off those assets essentially before the deal closed. And by uh, within 60 days of the deal being closed, we had sold almost two thirds of the assets. And what that enabled us to do was have a good basis in the assets we kept. And importantly, where we kept the assets was really importantly. They were almost all in California, New York, uh, or Boston. And had we held on to other things, suburban Chicago, um, Stanford, Connecticut, it would have been a bad outcome for us, but we held on to the right assets. The storm came in 08, 09. We were able to hold on because we were deleveraged. And then as the sun came back up over time, we sold those assets and ended up tripling our investors' money. But along the way, it was definitely um, a little bit harrowing. And yes, we were very fortunate to get the sales done when we did. Well, let's talk about Hilton. You bought Hilton and um, paid a price that many people thought in the industry was pretty high. And then Hilton had some problems. Did you worry that Hilton was not going to survive? And I should point out you're now the chair of Hilton and Hilton turned out to be a great deal. But at the time, were you worried it wasn't going to make it? It was a little bit scary for sure. We bought Hilton even later. We, we committed in July of 07, closed at the end of 07. Our timing could not have been worse to buy a lodging business. And um, the good news was we had enough liquidity in the company we hired a tremendous CEO in Chris Nassetta, and the underlying business was a great business. Global travel is something that continues to grow, and these great branded companies, Hilton with Hampton Inn and Doubletree and Waldorf, Hilton Garden, we thought could really grow not only in the United States, but around the world. And so when the crisis came, we did buy some debt at a discount, which helped, but ultimately what helped the most was this was a terrific business in a great sector with a good management team, excellent management team. 
And that led to us having an enormous gain for our investors, $14 billion. And I would say even more importantly for me, what it taught me was that when you're investing, if you own something really great, you need the staying power to get through it. And the lessons of 08, 09 of Hilton and Equity Office, if you own good stuff, if you can ride through to the other side, that's really the key. And in Hilton's case, it was in a great sector. It recovered in a great way. It's a wonderful company. And because of my friendship with Chris, all these years later, I'm still the chairman. I love the business. But it, the lessons from that were so powerful. And for the real estate investors on this call, I think it's really important, which are, is this a good place? Is this just a temporary moment? If it is, then you want to hold on. The dangers are when the wind is at your face long term, when you have secular challenges. In this case, it was exactly the opposite. So uh, when the uh, Great Recession happened, many opportunistic real estate funds uh, had big problems, as you know. Blackstone seems to have avoided that largely. How did you manage to not get uh, imploded by the Great Recession as many other opportunistic real estate funds did? What was your secret? I think the secret, secret was we had sold a lot prior to the crisis. A lot of these deals followed that same premise uh, we talked about, which was we were buying public company real estate at better pricing. We were selling off a portion and buying down our basis and in the process deleveraging. And we were very focused on always having term on our debt and liquidity in our funds so that when the storm happened, we could go out, provide needed liquidity to the businesses, go out and buy debt cheaply. And then we held on and we were able to be on the other side for the recovery. And I would say this most recent crisis at the firm level, although the crisis itself was much shorter from a valuation standpoint, was very similar. The same concept of good businesses, hold on, right capital structure, you've got staying power to get through it and firepower to take advantage of opportunities. So it's a simple formula, you just gotta stick with it because you don't know when the storm's coming. So, um, and when you're heading up the real estate business for Blackstone, you have three responsibilities, I guess. One is to raise the money, two is to invest the money and negotiate the deals, and three is to ultimately exit. So what did you enjoy the most? Uh, raising the money, looking for the deals, negotiating them, or helping to improve the assets and ultimately selling them? That's interesting. Uh, you know. I loved, I, as a deal person, I always loved new opportunities. So when you stumbled on, for instance, we bought a big life science office company called Biomed, which turned out to be a phenomenal investment. Um, you know, finding a new opportunity, learning about a new space, visiting a new geography, um, some moment where that light bulb goes off and you say, gosh, goods are increasingly moving from physical retail to online. We should buy more warehouses, particularly in this last mile. And let's not just do it in the US, let's do it in Canada and Europe and Asia. I'd say it's that sort of um, process of learning about new industries, new geographies, new trends, and then computing that back into, hey, how can I action that to make money? What's happening in terms of content explosion is amazing because we're all watching movies and music, videos on our phones, what does that mean for real estate? Gee whiz, maybe we should go out and buy a bunch of studios and office space in Burbank, California. So that to me, that sort of um, connecting of the dots is probably my favorite part. So before you left running the real estate business, you began to get Blackstone into the home business, the personal home bills. You bought enormous numbers of personal homes. Uh, why did you do that and how's that worked out? Yeah. So again, coming back to this idea of, of thinking about themes where you have a conviction, we had a view after the financial crisis that the largest asset class in the world in the private sector, U.S. homes, had fallen 35, 40% in value, and in some markets, more than 50%. And the question was, will this recover? In my mind, like all hard assets, they have to recover to physical replacement costs. And so how can we set ourselves up to go and buy these homes and benefit from the recovery? And in the process, help the communities invest in vacant homes that had been post foreclosure, um, fix them up and rent them out so that families who may not afford to buy could rent in those communities. And so we saw it as a real win-win. 
We set up a team uh, to go out and do this, and we started building a business from scratch. And we thought we were going to buy big portfolios from banks, and none of that happened. And we just ended up buying 50,000 homes, onesie twosie. Um, we ultimately merged with another company. We took this business public, and we made a fair amount of money for our investors. And in the process, as I said, I think did something good for the housing market and for a lot of families. And so it, it was based on this premise that post the financial crisis, we were underbuilding housing. And, and that was our way to express it. And again, as I think about investing, it doesn't matter if it's our logistics push, what we do in India, IT parks, in real estate, or what we're doing in all sorts of things in private equity about rising middle classes, aging demographics, try to find these big themes and figure out a way to express it in, in a certain asset class. That's what we're trying to do. Well, in the real estate area now, uh, what is particularly attractive to you now as you look at real estate? You're not running the global real estate business, but you're overseeing the person who is. So tell us, uh, what do you find particularly attractive? We won't tell anybody, so we won't bid the prices up, but just tell us what you think is attractive. Yeah, so fortunately, I have amazing successors who are doing an even better job running the business. Ken Kaplan, Kathleen McCarthy, who co-head our real estate business, and an unbelievable team of partners. And I'd break it into two camp camps. One is um, the cyclical recovery. Um, hotels would be a great example. I think people are going to get back on the road. We've been buying hotels in Japan, the United States. We bought a big holiday park business uh, in the UK. We, we love that sort of cyclical recovery, particularly around leisure. We own a water park business that has huge demand. I'd also say I think the office markets will offer some opportunity because the sentiment is pretty negative. And particularly in markets with heavy technology exposure and creative industries, I think leasing demand will start to come back. So I would put those in the cyclical recovery bucket. And then secularly, um, we still like last mile logistics because of this movement of goods online. We like life science office buildings uh, because of the explosion in demand in places like Cambridge, Mass, and South San Francisco. We like rental housing, um, single family, multifamily rental housing around the globe because there's been an underbuilding of housing. And so those would be the big areas I would say that are focused. And I would just add in general, cities where tech and creative folks are housed are, are more attractive. So um, that's very bullish for obviously the West Coast of the US and Austin and Cambridge, parts of New York City. It's bullish for Toronto, London, Amsterdam, um, Bangalore, Shenzhen, Tel Aviv, parts of Tokyo. If somebody said as a real estate you know, investor, where should I go? Go where those creative talents, where those people are populated, because that's where there's going to be the most economic activity. Now, recently you said uh, publicly that there were three areas of focus for Blackstone. One was, you've already, one you've already mentioned, travel. Another was housing, which you just mentioned but another was sustainability. How important is sustainability to the investments you're now making? I think it's really important. Um, for us, uh, as a firm, we've announced that every time we buy a new asset, a new company, we're gonna try to reduce hydrocarbon emissions by 15%. We think it's the right thing to do uh, for the planet, the right thing to do for our investors. Um, in addition to that, we've been going out there and looking at some of these huge trends and how we can play it. I would say it's a little less so in real estate, but in our credit business, we've been probably the leading lender in the solar space privately to a bunch of folks who do distributed generation, things with industrial and commercial enterprises. We're trying to find ways to lend money to developers of solar assets. In our equity energy business, We've been working on all sorts of projects around hydro as well as solar. And then there are some basic businesses like a company that builds uh, towers for transmission lines, which normally would not seem so exciting. But today, given what's happening to electrification of the grid, we are excited about buying a business like that. So we're looking everywhere how to play what is another mega trend and theme sustainability. And as real estate investors, I think we can all do our part. Here in New York, we built the largest urban solar project in the world on top of Stuyvesant Town. 
um, I think certainly the largest in the United States. We're looking to do more to both give back uh, across our assets, but at the same time, try to find investment opportunities. I think this is a huge trend in both private and public markets. Okay, let me ask you what you do to spend some downtime. Do you have any hobbies or relaxations or sports? So you don't work 100 hours a week, I hope, or not more than that. Uh, what do you do when you have some downtime? Uh, well, I spend a lot of time with my family. Uh, I would say that is definitely my priority. Um, I like to exercise and get out there, uh, be physical uh, to the extent I can. Um, I would say, you know, I love being social when it's possible. Um, and I would say the things I miss are, I probably, I, I don't get to read much these days uh, because I'm reading investment committee memos. Um, and, and I don't, um, I don't have as much free time maybe as one would love, uh, but I'm passionate about what I do. I really enjoy what I do. And I would add, you brought it up at the beginning. Uh, my wife and I spend a bunch of time on philanthropy. Uh, we have a terrific woman, our friend Dana Zucker, who runs our foundation. And, and there we focus on two key areas, which is uh, BRCA related cancers. Uh, these are cancers that come from a genetic mutation that lead to very high incidence of ovarian and breast cancer amongst women. Uh, unfortunately, we lost my wife's sister, Faith, to uh, BRCA-related cancer. We set up a center at Penn, and we focus on a bunch of institutions across the country trying to accelerate research and awareness, um, treatment, and ultimately prevention. And then we focus on low-income kids in New York, uh, and that for us has been um, really rewarding education, opportunity, healthcare. Uh, we set up a children's savings program here in District 30 in Queens in New York. And we just love the idea of helping kids because our children who live in New York City have all this opportunity. And 6% of the kids a mile north of my kids have a chance uh, to attend to graduate a four-year college. So we really want to be able uh, to make a difference. And I would say on the philanthropy, it's a passion for us and something Mindy and I do together. And that makes it a lot of fun. And so I, I do think about, I know, David, you've been a leader around philanthropy, you know, that when you're given this kind of good fortune, you know, when it's all over, they're not going to say, what were your net IRRs? They're going to say, you know, what, what kind of children did you raise? How did you give back to the larger community? And that's something that I definitely focus on. And now I'd say the philanthropy like business is something I really enjoy. The people you meet, the creativity, the intelligence of these scientists, it's the same sort of discovery process that I love about investing. Okay, well, um, I've said that private equity is the highest calling of mankind. Um, are your children uh, gonna go into private equity? Have you kind of besieged them to do that or are they gonna let them do something else? I would say it seems highly unlikely. I would love one of them to go into something financially, but no one seems to have much interest. Um, you know, I, I'm hopeful that I'm going to get at least one doctor. I, I think I've got a, a writer, uh, a, a change the world lawyer, and maybe an entrepreneur. And I just want them to do whatever they're passionate about. Because as you know, when you love what you do, whatever that is, you tend to have a much greater chance of having success at that chosen field. Now, you said you're an English major at Penn, among other things. Uh, what would you say is the quality of English in investment committee memos? <laughs> I would say um, needs improvement would be the grades. Um, uh, although I would tell you the challenge in investment committee memos is not the English. It's actually the length of the memos where people think they're going to overwhelm you with the 75-page memo. But the real issue is, wait, is there a new technology that's fundamentally changing everything that this business does and therefore 20 years of history isn't relevant? And so uh, my frustration with investment committee memos is less about the pros and more is about what is the key risk and how have we addressed it? How have we thought about it? And, and at times I feel like people underestimate the pace of change. And I think as investors, recognizing how quickly the economy is changing, how quickly technology is changing things. That's the biggest risk, and you've got to get that right in your memo. 
Um, yes, I tell people all the time, the quality of a deal does not vary directly with the, uh, with the uh, size of the memo. So you don't have to have a 500 page memo to convince me it's a good deal. But anyway, I'm sure you have the same perspective. So um, look, people that are watching this, um, they're gonna be a little not happy to see this because you have a perfect life. You've got a marriage that's working wonderfully. You've got four terrific daughters. You're at the top of a big firm. Everything is, tell us something that's not good. Make us feel better that you have made some mistake. Tell us about a real estate deal you did that didn't work out or something that make us feel like you're human as well, okay? Do you have anything like that you could tell us? Yeah, I'm so human, you can't believe. Um, I'd say a few things. Uh, first, on a personal note, you, you talked about uh, the balance. And I, I would say um, that's a challenge. Uh, I'm sure you've experienced it. You know, can you um, be present as a, a father, a husband, a son, whatever, when you're all in in one of these jobs? And it's something I struggle with every day. On the investing side, what I'd say, um, certainly we've made mistakes. Um, it's funny, during the run-up in 08, 09, maybe I'll go back even earlier, when I was younger, in 99, I, I um, got caught up in the dot-com mania buying buildings in Silicon Valley. And there was a, a, a crummy building on North, North First Street in San Jose. It's probably worth $100 a foot. And we ended up paying, I don't know, $250, $300 a foot because the tenants were paying crazy rents. And the big tenant in the building was called GoBosch.com. Go big or stay home dot com. And of course, I should have stayed home. But I got caught up in the frenzy and lost sight of fundamental value. And I would say the same thing in 05, 06, when housing was going crazy. We stayed away from housing, stayed away. And we finally did a deal with a home builder and a JV and a structured deal. And we put $150 million on it. And within 12, 18 months, the wheels started coming off the housing market and we had gotten caught up in this frenzy. And, and then I would just say, look, as investors, you miss things all the time. I mean, look, we, you know, did we have any recognition of what was gonna happen in cryptocurrency? Did I have a sense of how quickly markets were gonna come back a year ago, uh, particularly in the physical world? I should have, we should have bought a bunch of stuff faster. You're constantly making mistakes. You're constantly you know, getting it wrong. And, and for me, it's just, I wake up every day and I'm like, how can I be better? How can I improve? Um, you know, if, if Mindy was on this, she could give you chapter and verse of all my human flaws and, and look like everybody, I make a lot of mistakes, but my, my persistence is the thing. And I, I'm so desperately want to succeed and I want this firm to be successful. Okay. Well, as we get ready to wrap up, I want to make, I ask you a question that I think all Blackstone shareholders would like to hear you say that you're not going to do this, but it was reported that President Trump uh, considered you for Secretary of Treasury, even though you're a Democrat. Um, I assume at some point, uh, Secretary, as President Biden might call you up. Do you have any interest in being Secretary of Treasury or other famous position or senior position in the federal government, or are you committed to Blackstone for the foreseeable future? I am committed to Blackstone. I have the most amazing job, as we said at the beginning of this discussion. Uh, I really love what I do and I love the people I do it with. Um, and so I, I, I'm planning on being here and playing my heart out as long as I can. Okay, well, Jonathan, I wanna thank you for a very interesting conversation and um, we covered a fair amount of territory, territory and thanks for, for, uh, for being with us, okay? David, thank you. I love the questions. It's great to see you as always. Thanks a lot. Bye. Um, thank you to David and Jonathan for that great discussion. Uh, there are lots of lessons learned and food for thought of what's to come as we emerge from the pandemic. John's remarks about good business decisions, holding on, staying power and firepower make this industry seem so easy to navigate. But now we're going to pivot to another insightful team of real estate industry experts who will discuss what is happening now and what they forecast for the future. This impressive group is well known by all, so I'm going to quickly bring them into the discussion. Leading our conversation is Marianne Tai, CEO of the New York Tri-State Region at CBRE. Joining her is Jim Collins, Managing Director at Morgan Stanley. Sandeep Rathrani, CEO of WeWork. Natalie Palatichev, 
President and CEO at Ivanhoe Cambridge, and Owen Thomas, CEO of Boston Properties. Time permitting, we will ask the panel some audience questions at the end. Please feel free to type in any questions in the Q&A box. And with that, I will turn it over to Mary Ann because I can see her now. Hi there, can you see me? Yeah. I see Sandeep, who I had not seen before. Hello everybody, good morning. Uh, that, by the way, was such a great conversation. Um, and I think actually set the table perfectly because what we have in each of the panelists this morning um, are people with really deep experience in different segments of the market and different product types and different geographies. Um, and what we really want to talk about is what, what we think is going to happen in the post-pandemic world, not only in North America, um, but uh, globally. So what I thought I would do is start first with Nathalie, because um, you, I think, have the widest lens of anybody we're, we're talking to. Sandeep, for sure, you have the global view as well. But I think, Nathalie, you, you cut across product types and geographies. So can you give us um, a sort of table setting? What you think um, is happening in the world of real estate now in different sectors and different geographies? Um, thank you, Mary, and good morning, everybody. So I, I don't know if it's a blessing or a curse, uh, because uh, depending on the day, that's uh, that's true that we have the, the whole uh, globe as being uh, uh, the, the choice that we, we have to make. So sometimes making choices, it's, it's difficult, but that's that's the way it is. And we have we are so uh, pension found, so we are far different from uh, from John Gray, for example, in the way we are dealing with our business, because we, we have to have a very strong vision because we long term capital, meaning that we are not looking, we are looking for performance. Sometimes uh, people are wrong regarding that, but we are looking both for on short term and long term performance. So you have to have a very strong vision about what you are building because you are not building it for the next five years. You are really building it for the next, I don't know, 10 to 20 years. So um, based on, on what we have seen, I, I would say that Firstly, um, the, the rebound or whatever it calls is going to be very domestic. More than ever, real estate is going to be domestic. So uh, I, and it's uh, sometimes which is not new. We thought that at a point we're going to be more global, but, but what we see is so different from one location to the other that I think that it's probably the first lesson uh, uh, learned from this pandemic. Uh, of course, the influence of a vaccine, but also something very special in terms of geopolitics, which is this, uh, what I call the, the risk, risk aversion, which means that depending on the country is going to reopen far differently. Uh, and I'm, I'm very familiar with uh, the European situation, as you know. And, and for example, there is such a difference between France and UK in the way they are looking forward because of this risk management, which is far different in the different countries, depending on the culture. So it's it's my, my, my first thing. Second thing, uh, I, I think that there is kind of concept of what I call the inevitable cities, which means that there are some places around the world where it's just going to be like, okay, it was uh, shut down and it was going to be reopened from almost one day to the other. And it's not going to be the case everywhere around the world. And sometimes in some cities where we're invested in, it's going to be like more a willing and pushing uh, decision that the um, companies, uh, the investor would have to make to really reopen the city and get back to what we were. And, and, and in some cities, once again, it's going to be like automatic because those cities are really uh, inevitable. And uh, what we have to do also is to distinguish, and I think it's probably the most difficult thing to do right now, uh, the short-term noise uh, versus the macro trend signals and, and really trying to, to find what it's going to be like the lines of investments and getting back what I said about the long-term capital that's very important for us. So in a way that's complicated, but in another way, I could say that finally, we had no surprises for this pandemic. Everything was on the table before the pandemic. And, and if I look at, at the screen, I, I've read a lot of things about you, uh, uh, gentlemen, and, and, and you said, and, and of course, I'm, I'm, I'm closer to some of you. So, um, you know, you have said so many, you had said so many times be so before the pandemic, what was going to happen that we, we shouldn't be surprised. So uh, I, I think it's, it's for us um, the opportunity to, uh, to like, be more in, in 
innovative and creative than what we used to be because we used to be a very traditional industry. So I think it's an opportunity. It's, it's what I call a kind of a salutary wake up call uh, for the, uh, the, the, the oil industry. We have to move faster. We have to really make some bets. We have to be humble about what we don't know yet and what we're going to know in the future. But once more, it's, it's a long question to your, a long answer to your question, Marianne, but it's, it's really the, the local equation which is going to be for us uh, the key of the success. And the equation has three parts, our local teams on the ground, our partners, like-minded partners, which is very key uh, to our heart, and uh, the fact that um, as, as, as some of you uh, do too, uh, the, our ability to do development and to really like design uh, the next generation of, uh, of the, the real estate and being like a leader in, in some of the places around the world in, in this area to really show uh, and lead the path and show, show the way. So that would be my my long answer to your to your short yeah. question. Yeah. I think it's a, I think it's a great table uh, setting, and I, I think the piece we should pull out right now is the geography piece, um, because one of the things that jumped out to me in the um, DLA Piper State of the Market Survey is that there were no gateway cities uh, in the top five. So I would love to hear from uh, when we do Sandeep next, and can I also say feel free to jump in any of you at any point. But Sandy, I, I know you have a global view as well. Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts on the change in geography uh, that we're all seeing um, in the in, uh, sort of after the pandemic or, or toward the end of the pandemic, however we want to characterize this period. Thanks, Marianne, for having me on. Um, I would sort of sit back and say that I was listening to John Gray and David as well, uh, and, and I sort of focus on, you know, more, and I think John said it well, he said, you know, where do you find locations which have creativity and tech and where is talent based? Uh, and, and, and effectively, the other part, if you think about what he said was, you know, which are the industries that are disruptive, right? You know, they've invested in logistics as a, as a tremendous factor. So if we sort of look at it from a global perspective, I will tell you that the rebound has happened much faster than I would have predicted. Uh, you know, I would sort of sit back and say in over 60 markets, we've had double digit growth. Uh, you know, in the first quarter, April has probably been the best month for us. Uh, if I was to go back to the last good month was probably February of 2020. And actually we're seeing it uh, in, in the international markets have much more in the major gateway cities. I think John focused on the US markets when he mentioned uh, Austin, Nashville, Raleigh, Durham, uh, you know, Charlotte, and I think he said Miami. Um, but, but if you look at the international markets, it's still the big gateway cities. It's still Seoul and Korea. It's still, you know, Singapore. Uh, it's still Tokyo and Japan. Uh, you know, it's still Munich uh, in Germany. It's still London in the UK. And I think he mentioned London in the UK or Manchester in the UK. So internationally, inter interestingly enough, it's still the big gateway cities. Uh, domestically, uh, we obviously have seen and I would say these are secondary cities that were on the rise, though. I mean, that's the big difference. When you think about a city like Austin, Austin, you know, there was investments made for the last 15, 20 years, and it's been growing rapidly, uh, and it takes a long period of time. You think about Raleigh and Durham, they built a brand new airport, an RDU airport, in the anticipation of what was then going to be called Research Triangle Park. Uh, and it took 20 years for it to come to, come to, to, come to play. Uh, so they're growing at a very fast rate, but they're growing from a very small base. And I think that's what people sometimes forget. Uh, Miami, if you think about it, Miami has one building of a million square feet under construction. Uh, and, and so it'll be 15, 20 years before Miami becomes really a tech hub. And if that's if we focus on infrastructure, we focus on schools, it takes a lot to make a great city. Uh, and, 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 and I do believe, though, as we see it, you know, and I will say, you know, being uh, being obviously headquartered in New York, uh, for the first time in March, what we look at our business is, is our is our churn or the number of deaths that we're losing more than the deaths that we're gaining. And for the first time, it was net test positive for the month of March, and actually April followed through as well, which means that actually people are coming back into into the into the bigger cities, even a city like San Francisco, where finally seeing activity come back. Now again, we're starting off with a very large base, um, but that doesn't 
mean that those cities don't have the, the creativity, the, the tech talent, uh, but it doesn't mean that they're fastest growing cities because your base is much smaller and therein lies the difference. No, um, Owen, I, you have the uh, deepest perspective, I think, on the gateway city uh, situation. And I just wonder your thoughts uh, on this on this topic. Yeah, I think I would um, echo something that Sandeep said, which was uh, John Gray's comments in the last uh, session. You know, the, uh, we think key is to focus on where are the knowledge workers. And if you look at clusters of inventors in computer science, chemistry, biology, uh, all those areas, the gateway, you know, the gateway markets, the five to six that we focus on, those are the large, by and large, the largest clusters of those workers in the country. There are exceptions. Uh, Austin is in the top five on computer science, but all the cities we were operating in are the other, are the other four. So that gives us confidence uh, that we're in the right places. Oh, for, but I would say for the long term, uh, as Sandeep said, the the uh, other cities that were mentioned, like Austin and Nashville, they they are um, they come off a smaller base, so the percentages are always higher. They were doing well before the pandemic, and I think they'll uh, continue to do well. But I think you're seeing a part of this is time frame because. The gateway cities were, are, were much more locked down uh, during COVID and are opening up much more slowly than the cities in the South. I took one of my children on a college tour uh, throughout the Southeast um, about a month or two ago, and I was stunned, you know, at how um, open the hotels and, um, you know, the, <laughs> the less, uh, less um, masks that I saw on the streets. And it just felt a lot more open. And it's just very different from where certainly California is and to some extent, uh, New York and Boston. So I think you got a little bit of that. So we, we have a lot of confidence in the gateway markets, as I said, but I um, acknowledge that these uh, areas in the Southeast and Southwest are growing more rapidly here in the short term. Um, but I think the gateway markets will come back. Well, I, I do wanna circle back to the whole issue of uh government, how it varies in these different markets, uh, uh, how it impacts development, et cetera. But I do want to hear from Jim on the subject of capital flows and how you're seeing that and where where capital is moving uh, in this period. And uh, um, if, in fact, it's, it's mimicking uh, the geographic things we're talking about right now. Yeah, it's a great question. I think it is. I mean, I, uh, just to con contextualize it, I'll start with the discussion on rates because that's topical with everyone we're talking about who's investing. Um, you know, if the 10 year Treasury is at 160 today, we see it going to really 170, not a big movement by end of the year. Um, <clears throat> and I think that's owed to the fact that, you know, Chairman Powell's been very, very open about the Fed's intentions this year to be supportive of growth. So we think of rates in the context of inflation, we're forced to think longer term about the interest rate picture and all the investors we speak to, I think there's a, a pervasive sense that yes, rates are going up eventually, um, but there's, you know, there's a cushion in that and so too will NOI growth um, and fundamentals that underlie the real estate. So if you observe some you know, market, re market statistics, there are no real evident signs of caution from investors presently. Um, you know, we've got the REIT market trading at high single digit and AV premium overall. Um, levered multiples, FFO are trading at historic highs. Um, market implied cap rates at historic lows. Um, and, you know, I just, I don't see that rates are deterring capital flows into the U.S. Um, and as evidence, I point to kind of first quarter uh, performance of, of the RMZ being you know, number seven, I think, by in the last uh, 25 or 26 years in performance, and that was in a raising rate environment. So we we see capital flows, I think, consistent with what we heard from John this morning, really taking great interest in the recovery and the reopening trade. So um, adding to uh, the sort of filters that you all have to think about, I want to go to something that Owen raised in our, our uh, prep conversation. And I know, Owen, you're very active with the roundtable uh, in DC. How much do the politics of a particular geography impact your own, each of your activities in that geography? 
Um, Owen, why don't you, uh, this is a topic that uh, I know is close to you. Do you want to want to talk about it a bit? Because I think, I think that the interesting part, I certainly experienced this in New York. Um, I, I can see in the post-vaccine world, uh, New Yorkers increasingly comfortable. But what makes them uncomfortable are not things that have to do with health or, or wellness in any way. Obviously, they want that. and We want to see that reflected in our building uh, stock. But what I see makes them uncomfortable are things that really have to do uh, with government and how it's uh, performing uh, both the, its basic tasks and also its vision for the future. So I'd, I'd love to hear from each of you your thoughts on how that becomes a filter as you're thinking about where to place uh, your investments. Yeah. So, Marion, I, I would say a couple, just two comments on this. One, just a general comment. I, you know, I do think the government overlay is becoming even more important to real estate. I mean, we've always all obviously focused on entitling projects and tax policies and all those types of things. But, we, you know, we've got changing tax policies at both the state and the federal level. Uh, we have the Biden administration proposing very significant infrastructure plans. Infrastructure is critical to commu commercial real estate, as all of us know. And then um, the needed change to a green economy uh, and greening the built environment. Uh, there will be, um, I think, opportunities to finance these projects, but also there are going to be regulations around it, and that's going to touch uh, the built environment in a much stronger way in the years ahead. So I think everybody in the industry needs to pay a lot more attention. As it relates to um, investing in place, um, clearly focusing on um, local policies and particularly taxes is critically important. Um, you know, we are wa obviously watching carefully what's going on in the state house in New York, what potentially could go on in the city of New York, what's going to be proposed in California. You know, higher taxes are not um, generally helpful to real estate uh, values. I think safety and local infrastructure is also critical, you know, when we think about place. And, you know, there has been, however, a lot of um, discussion during the pandemic about uh, movements, particularly out of New York and San Francisco to other areas of the country. So we looked into it, and I've seen reports on this and actually looked at the data. And if you get the U.S. Postal Service data on actually what moves occurred out of San Francisco and New York, um, the uh, out of state is not a top 10 location, uh, relocation out of San Francisco. All most of the people that left went to uh, neighbor. They went to the East Bay. They went to Marin. They stayed in the area. They just went left the city of San Francisco. And if you look at the destinations outside of, of San Francisco where people went, the top one was Seattle, the second one was New York, and the third one uh, was, was Austin, Texas. So I thought that was interesting. And if you look at New York, uh, again, most of the top five relocations were Long Island, Westchester, and commutable locations in, um, uh, in the state of Connecticut. And if you look at the out-of-state migrations, actually L.A., is at the top of the list, and Miami is um, almost half of the amount of people that moved to LA. So, so again, when you look at the data, they they differ from the headlines. If I may, Marianne, in terms of, of politics and influence, I I really think that pressure on a housing accessibility is going to be pretty key in the discussions that we're going to have in the short term, and we see that more and more in different countries around the world, and not always the socialist country or so-called socialist countries. It's really everywhere now. And I, I really think that, in fact, offices are going to be linked more than ever to housing. And, and it, it's directly related to what we said about being close to talent. And, and talent's going to have to have the ability to, to, to pay for their housing. And they're going to choose, choose probably their housing and then their job in this order, which used to be the other way around in maybe uh, for the last generation. So we see that more and more there, there's a lot of, uh, of pressure on the ground and especially after the pandemic to really try to uh, uh, provide a new offer in terms of uh, affordable housing. 
uh, and, and and I can tell you that the the most uh, profitable thing uh, we have made recently is the manufacturer homes uh, uh, investment, which was really very profitable over the last year. Uh, so it's uh, it's less glamorous to, <laughs> compared to what we used to do, but it's really so aligned with the needs of the communities right now that it's something that we can't just ignore. So uh, housing, I think, and, and, the, and the pressure of, of the different governments on the, on the different cities around the world, including Montreal. I was uh, in a panel yesterday talking about it. So even in a, in a city like Montreal, it's something which is really on the top of the list of any government right now. So Sandeep, what are you seeing uh, globally as, as far as the interaction of government with uh, where you're choosing? Uh, to build up or to shed uh, uh, locations. You, you know, again, I, I think I think you know uh, there's a big difference, like as Owen said, between the headlines and the reality, right? Uh, I, I think the reality is still the fact that talent still goes to the big gateway cities. Um, you know, and again, what people and I think that Talon said this. You know, if you think about New York City as an example, there are one million white collar workers, right? Uh, even if we talk about people moving to city, you know, Long Island and Connecticut, there were 15,000 homes for sale in Connecticut. It's a fraction, right? It's a dot, okay? It, it can't move the needle. Uh, and people fail to realize it takes decades to build an infrastructure between housing, schools, subways, transportation. Uh, and so, so, so the only concern we have is, is it a slow migration, right? So. If the if taxes continue to rise and uh, you know uh, and, and 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 the infrastructure continues to fail and this becomes a security and safety issue over time, then you're going to start to see deterioration. And I know this from, the, from California, you know, studying it over and over again. High taxes never allowed people to leave California. It was other factors that that, that made people leave. And again, it's you know, again, it's it, it's it's a it's a and I think, yes, it's a deterioration over time. So I think the concern is not the, in the short term. The concern is what's the long term view? And if you think about New York as a city, right, uh, you know, under Bloomberg, the, the perception changed. OK, uh, you know, the safety and security under Giuliani, who brought it in or, you know, and the Dukakis, who actually was the first person who the Denkins was the first person to bring in safety and security and policing of the uh, of, of those streets. So these things can shift dramatically based upon the leadership. Uh, and, and, and so I, I, I do think that, that we need to have a much more longer term view and people don't make decisions on, the, on a short term basis. And, and, and uh, I think you look at politics over, over a much longer horizon than over a shorter horizon. Uh, so I, you know, I, I, I'm not such a big believer that, that people you know, are just gonna flee because I think the percentages you know, are very, very small that are fleeing as, and, and I think, you know, Owen gave you some statistics, but I think people have to appreciate the infrastructure, these gateway cities, the, the, the talent pools in these gateway cities uh, it is pretty tremendous. Um, and so I, I'm a, I, you know, I think politics are important, but a four year term doesn't change an environment. Uh, and, you know, effectively Schumer has provided enough capital in in uh, in the stimulus package that really the state and the city don't have to raise taxes right so they're doing it they're doing it for a different reason it's not it's not to right, balance budget as i call it they're doing it for punishment um they're, they're, they're certainly not doing it because they need to do it what's the roundtable's uh, prognosis on 1031 disappearing just out of curiosity well i think i i think we haven't heard a lot about it from a con a congressional representatives that we talked to, uh, but it did appear in the most recent Biden plan. And the history of 1031 is that when you look at it, you can say, wow, there are these billions of dollars of transactions that are going on uh, tax free. And if we tax that, you know, we're going to generate X in revenue and that numbers in the billions. But what I think um, legislators figure out when they dig into this is that if you take away the tax-free nature of the like-kind exchange, a lot of the deals won't happen. If you know, I would say a very small percentage of them will happen, and therefore there's no tax revenue. So I'm not sure it's as um, generative from a revenue standpoint as 
um, legislators might think. So I, I think the notion of that getting repealed is uncertain. Well, I, I certainly hope that analysis will guide, uh, but one of the things I think that we're all experiencing is observing that uh, we're watching things that are not necessarily based on uh, revenue generation or uh, uh, classic data as to why you would change a tax program, but we're looking at sort of philosophical overlays. And that's that's the thing I think we're also uh, balancing. But I, I interrupted Jim mid-flow, I, but I did want to get, I didn't know if the round table had sort of a point of view um, on uh, the probability of 1031. So Jim, what were you going to say? I know you were segueing somewhere. <laughs> Yeah, that, oh, and that's great perspective. I was going in a different direction because he said government. I don't know if it's government or governance, but you know, over the last decade, we've seen a trend and a focus on ESG. And I think what we're noticing from our boards and executive teams that we spend a lot of time with is really welcoming the challenge of, you know, not just penciling developments to an IRR, but, you know, finding a way to do good and do well. Um, and it's, it's just a different mindset. And I think it's, it's refreshing and people are you know, welcoming of the investor attitude towards like, this is very, very important to us. What are you doing? Um, and it's been kind of a, a, a nice change over the years. And, and how, do we believe it's actually translating is what I would ask because um, certainly the environmental issues have been under discussion. I remember um, the Durst organization talking in the nineties about sustainability and new construction Etc. And then I would try to talk to a tenant about it, a, co a company that might occupy their office space, and just get a sort of blank stare and, and circle back to how efficient is the floor, what are the economics, etc. Um, again, I'd, I'd be interested in any of you. Is uh, are you seeing a, uh, a is, is it actionable what's happening? Because ESG is certainly in the conversation, but how is it changing things? If, if I, I did, would... Mary, yeah. sorry. No, please, please go ahead. No, I, I was just about to say that it really depends from one location to the other again, and, and we see definitely more pressure in some countries where it's uh, really a question that we have more and more from our tenants. And uh, it's not really their question, it's more their employees question. So we see that in the way uh, those people try to attract people. It's one of the questions which is uh, really frequently raised uh, when you hire somebody. And, and I can tell you that um, my own ratio for Ivana Cambridge is probably eight out of 10 people that we are hiring put the ESG commitment that we, we have taken as being the basis of their choice. So we see that more and more, and, and it's where we are evolving in a more business to customer uh, industry than just business to business. So we we see that more and more and and the other thing is we have also in the uh, um, valuation process more and more questions about the obsolescence of the building and the green uh, part of the, the obsolescence is something that they they try to value or to discount more and more so even if you do not believe in anything regarding the climate change or if you don't have it, it's, I don't want to put that as a philosophical question, then we really see some, some pressure locally from the tenants, the employees, and sometimes evaluators also. Does that shake out by age, Natalie, in terms of hiring? I'm very, I'm very interested in your saying eight out of 10 people call definitely. that out. Yes, it's, it's something which is definitely generational, <laughs> if I yeah. can call that way. <laughs> It, 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 very, very. I could, um, if I, yeah. I could add, I, I, I just would m make a couple of comments on this. First of all, um, ESG is absolutely getting more important. I would also point out ESG are three pretty different topics. Uh, they are lumped all together, but I, even in our own firm, we have three different groups in Boston Properties that deals with ESG, and it's a challenge to report on it because we have to bring all these different disciplines together, and they're not even really related. So, um, or they're uh, not closely related. So I'll just make that point. But on going to the E part, which I think is the, the really the, 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 the main driver of the question, um, there, there is increasing, th this is the easiest thing to invest in I've ever worked on because the, it's only gonna get worse and the investments that you're making are only gonna get more important. 
it's not cyclical, the path is unfortunately clear. And so um, what I mean by that is I, I think that in amongst our, when we think of the impacts here, I think of four constituencies. One is our customers. I will absolutely agree, not all customers care about this and, and it varies a little bit by city and, and what industry the customer is in, but some care deeply. And I can tell there are tenants in our portfolio that wouldn't go into some of our buildings if they weren't lead platinum and if they didn't have um, top of market sustainability characteristics. Um, yeah, I, I second, think that's uh, the seat change. Yeah. Yeah. The, and and, the, and then the, capital the, providers. They're, you know, we're a public company. We're now starting to see ETFs uh, for real estate companies based on their ESG scores as opposed to their market cap. That's an opportunity uh, for our shareholders, our, our existing shareholders. We did, um, we've done two, two, uh, I think a little over 2 billion in green bonds. And the last one we did, if our CFO was on the line, he would say that we got some better rate as a result. Not, not huge, maybe several basis points, but that's a change from a year ago where I'm not sure I could have made that statement. Um, communities, you know, we're in coastal cities, believe me, they care about ESG. And if you are switched on and can help them think through if to the extent they're interested in your help, you know, what their policies are and how they're going to deal with it, that's only a plus. And then, uh, Nat Natalie, your comments, your um, employees, you know, you, you're more purposeful as an employer if you do these things. So I think there's a benefit there as well. So, S Sandeep, um, I, this, this also helps us sort of say, uh, segue a bit uh, into actual product types, but I, I love your thoughts on ESG's impact going forward on both the, uh, the tr business travel environment. Again, one of the things I know uh, that WeWork does is offer the opportunity to use uh, your uh, space uh, worldwide. Do you, what's your point of view on uh, whether business travel will be as robust and if some of this is really being driven off environmental concerns? Um, look, I, I think they will be, I think business travel will return, not to the extent it ever was. And I think Jamie Dimon said it the best yesterday. I want my people back because I lost business because someone went and visited someone uh, and got a sales deal done, which is what we've been saying all along. There's nothing like, uh, you know, face-to-face -face interaction. And the moment you, you travel and you take business from a competitor, it's game over, right? Uh, you know, I think there'll be more internal meetings, quite honestly, uh, by, by video conferencing on an international basis. But I think, you know, client-based meetings will revert back to in-person as soon as they can. Uh, and, and I don't think people, I, I could be wrong, I don't think people are thinking of, you know, environmental concerns uh, based upon travel, uh, because obviously they're not reflecting it in their personal life. Uh, planes are full, hotels are full, uh, travel for holiday is is incomprehensible. Marriott's revenue is at pre-pandemic levels. So, so I, I think it's uh, I think the the I think it'll be more uh, limited, uh, you know, from a from a from an international travel for employee perspective. Uh, but again, for culture building, collaboration, innovation, you got to come together. And I don't think that actually people are thinking, you know, on the e part of it anyway uh, to limit travel. Uh, in our business, I, I think that I think there's a you know I think there's a you know if you if you want to look at it differently, uh, and I don't know how this even equates to ESG, but I could find some twisted way to make it equate to uh, ESG, and I'm quite good at uh, twisting the story. Um, so I would sort of sit back and say, I, and I go back. Public. One of the things that John Gradian said was one of his best investments was investing in GGP, but he sold out early enough. So, uh, <laughs> but, um, 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 but, 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 but be that as it may, is like you know, e-commerce disrupted and continues to disrupt, right? Uh, um, uh, you know, the, the mall industry, and people talk a lot about ESG in that industry, boxes, and you know, we did all these kind of studies, and at the end of the day what is better for the environment. Of course, depending on which side you were, you, you, you played around. So take that a little further, right? And I sort of sit back and say, you know, what is disruptive of the commercial office based business? And Owen and I have talked about this quite a bit, so there's no surprise to him, is that I actually think flex is the disruptor uh, of, of the uh, office space. 
And, and, and I think what happens is people think about flex office space as, as you know, hey, you can work from anywhere, you can you know, take, you know, and put in a computer and it's less than 15,000 square feet. You know, that was yesterday's flex. Tomorrow's flex is, you know, you're gonna be between 15,000 and 100,000 square feet. And effectively what happens is, you know, does a client say, I wanna make a five, 10, 15 year commitment? Do I wanna make this kind of an investment or do I take a two year, term okay don't know where my business is going and by the way is that better for the environment because i'm not tearing up you know construction work i'm adapting to existing space and you know uh, i'm you know i'm doing different kinds of things so actually flex is the first leading indicator i would say of of demand for long-term office space so if our business picks up then you know owen's business is going to spike uh, because it's just basically a lead indicator of saying, yeah, people want to come back to work uh, and they want to do it in that manner. And so, you know, I, I sort of sit back and say the way we look at ourselves is that the Flex business is now a two year term business and it's between 15,000 feet and 100,000 square feet. And essentially, that's where enterprise clients want to play uh, because they actually don't know where the future is going. But we're just a lead indicator to to, to Owen's business. And I, and I think they are intertwined, if you will. Um, and I do think at some stage in the game, because we've heard it over and over again, that, hey, do we want to make the capital investment uh, on a short-term basis? Now, if you've got a long-term commitment, it's a whole different capital affairs. But like I said, I don't know how that equates to ESG, but I thought I would uh, start the conversation in a different direction. So I, I can resist making two observations about your, your comments. Uh, the first is the first time I ever saw a video conference was in the 90s uh, at a firm uh, uh, since gone called Chiat Day. I don't know if any of you remember a, a big advertising, oh, advertising company. company. Exactly. And Jay Chiat, visionary in that field. He was the first person I when I visited uh, their office, he was the first person had no assigned seating. Everybody had lockers. We're, t we're talking about either 89, 90. I mean, this was the, you know, the Wild West. And he was very proudly showing around. And we come into a room that is his video conference room. And he says, this is how I'm avoiding business travel. This is how I'm interacting uh, with my customers. And I said, wow, you know, I wonder if that's going to change uh, uh, the way people engage. And he said, well, I'll tell you two things that it doesn't work for. He said, you can't sell anything remotely like this. He said, if you want to get new business, or you want to sell a new idea, you have to show up. And I remember it because he was such a visionary and such a proponent of, um, you know, doing things with technology, et cetera. And I realized that um, there are certain human traits that remain, which I, I also um, observe brings us to the issue of uh, office as a segment. And in fact, what your people, by the way, Sandeep, are training us to not call it co-working anymore, but to call it flex space. Um, so I, I'm, I'm diligently training myself not to use past terms, but I'll tell you the observation I have made in my own real estate practice about flex space. And that is oftentimes to your point, um, people make a decision to act and the space that they ultimately want to reside in isn't there, or they're unsure of the long-term profile. And flex space is the solution. I think to the point where so many um, owners are going to want to have components of their portfolio, depending on the size of the buildings, of course, or the complex, um, the flex space is going to become essential. And here, I, I always refer to Mitsubishi Estates uh, in uh, Tokyo, um, where in their uh, Marinucci district, they offer five different kinds of flex space to the tenants who are there. And they've been doing this for a number of years now. So I'd love uh, your thoughts uh, individually on uh, all, the, all the aspects that are floating around there about office today, um, whether it's work from home, work from anywhere, whether it's about flex space, et cetera. So I'd love to hear um, from, our, um, from our panelists about that, because it is to me, um, in an interesting way, again, the pandemic has accelerated change, and this has become all the more meaningful in light of what we've all just gone through. I mean, if I would just start off by saying we speak to a lot of enterprise clients and small medium businesses, and I, one will tell you we should take we should feel very we should feel good that 
uh, the business is bouncing back from its lows. Uh, we should feel good that small, medium businesses are coming back much faster uh, and, and taking space. Uh, and the reason is they need to collaborate, innovate at a much faster pace than larger organizations. Uh, enterprise clients are following the rule of vaccination. Uh, as vaccination has accelerated, the comeback has been rapid. Again, very good for our business because we provide a turnkey solution ASAP. So all of a sudden, we're seeing occupancies, you know, within 30 to 60 days of signing a 100,000 square feet lease, which uh, would have normally not been the case. Uh, and, and so it's so effectively, like I said, uh, you know, flexibility. Uh, and if you talk to the clients, they'll tell you today, 3% of their stock is uh, flexible space. And we you know, depending on who you believe, a CBRE report says 15% and a JLL report says 30%, but it doesn't matter. It's a massive uh, multiple of where it exists today, which means that TAM, the total addressable market is quite large. And I do agree with you. And uh, you know, I think the the, uh, the the owners of real estate at scale uh, will build a you know a flexible option within their premises, but it'll be different. It'll not be you know as people think it should be, which is you know these 15 to 25,000 square feet boxes that cater to small companies or mid-sized companies. It's going to be that 15 to 100,000 square feet or you know 10% of a building. Uh, that's going to be able to be reutilized. It's not the small spec suites like we used to do in the, I guess, in the year in the in 1990s and 2000s. It's going to be large size, uh, and we've, you know, obviously figured out a way to make them adaptable from one client to the next. Um, and 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 I do think that that will be uh, an, an amenity uh, to the building. And eventually, those clients, as we see it, grow out of our space and they grow into the same, hopefully, the same building. Uh, and, and effectively, I, I, I think I think there's a radical shift on what flex is from this small co-working to larger scale. Uh, and then there are obviously questions: How do you finance them? How do you build them? There are a lot of questions unanswered. But we do know that as we have already built them, uh, we see the demand uh, coming quite large, quite quickly for that 50 to 100,000 square feet tenants, uh, you know, in that flex market. So it's 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 changing rapidly, and I. And I do think, as you said, Marianne, it'll be part of every building. Uh, and, and, you know, we think that's correct because uh, uh, we think that you know, as we see enterprise and small business uh, requirements of 50 to 100,000 square feet, there's a tremendous tilt to having, uh, you know, the two year, uh, you know, uh, or so lease terms. And, and you can only do that if you can build a prototype that's reusable. Otherwise, you can't amortize it over two year periods. I think you also uh, put your finger on something else, though. The issue of financing uh, and, and valuation around flex space is a component uh, of an asset. And I think that's that's a challenging thing. I, and again, I don't well, know. Well, in, uh, in the short in the short term, it's a challenging thing because the thesis hasn't been proved out. As I always joke and say, yes. when the consumer wants something, the capital markets figure it out. Uh, we finance hotels all day long and they used, you stay by the night. Uh, you build a history. There's just not enough of a history right now uh, of what it is. And again, the jury's out. Uh, time will tell. But but over over a period of time, I could you know if if we're right, if the market if CBRE is right, if they've got a fantastic flex business, uh, phenomenal actually, I will say maybe the best in the industry. Um, and, and 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 if that's if they're right, then effectively. Mm -hmm. The, the, the future could be different. Five years from today, eight years from today, people may say, if you don't have flex in your business, maybe it's not financeable. Today, it could work in the opposite direction, but we will have to see. And look, look, we have enough of a portfolio of 50 million square feet, you know, where half today almost 60% is enterprise. Uh, it's not little. Uh, and, and effectively, if the thesis is correct, uh, the market will follow. And if the and, and, time, and time is the best indicator of it. And the early indications are that, that uh, it, it's, you know, it, it is, uh, the COVID has accelerated everything by five years. Uh, and, and it could be a, an important part of every building. And like I said, uh, you, know, you know, Boston Properties will have its own flex and, you know, uh, you know Jerry Spy will have his own flex. And, and, that's, and, that's, and, and that will be a good thing, not a bad thing. 
Natalie, I see that if you're I may, Mary, to get in here. Yes, please. <laughs> I'm not going to add anything. It's just impossible to talk about flex after Sandip, so I'm not going to go further in this direction <laughs> uh, because I, I can't be more. Uh, uh, I can have more insightful that he has, but I just want to, to add two things. First is that it, it's strange, but the correlation about the appetite or attractivity to uh, versatility of uh, the buildings are very, very different depending on the people you are talking to, meaning the, the rich tenant, they are looking for flexible um, uh, building because that's a kind of their brand advertisement. It's the way they are going to hire people. People. But if you talk to smaller uh, companies, it's more a question of just surviving. So it, it's the, the fact that people are going to get back to the office is really depending on the health of the company and, and the, 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 the way they are going to yes, tackle with the, the, uh, this after pandemic uh, uh, economic rebound or shock depending on the country. So that's that's very important because we have to adapt very much the kind of dialogue we have with our tenants because it's going to be different from one company to the other. And I would add one angle, and I'm sure Jim uh, could have some ideas around it, is that we see more and more connection between infrastructure and real estate. And, and because we be part of a big, uh, uh, the big CDPQ, we have more and more discussions with our infra friends about the way we could really build the neighborhood, including the two parts, because what we see is that everybody wants to get back to the office right now, almost everybody. The only thing that everybody's pointing out is the commuting part. They are not really happy or willing to, to take uh, to take the metro or whatever in the morning and to go to the office. That's the main part that we have to deal with, and it's not in our hands for the time being, but it's going to be, I think, a big thing that we have to deal with uh, in the future. And, and I don't know if you see, Jim, more and more common, I would say, equity or capital between those two uh, very um, traditional separated asset classes merging in, in one direction. I do, and, and it's so funny. Ask, whoever's point. answering the question, let me add something that's, that uh, came, just came in. Uh, from one of the folks listening in. Um, also, what are you all thinking about, landlords thinking about the customer experience? Are there are, are owners creating a reason for tenants to come back to their building? How, how is that translating, um, uh, if you will, to an obligation for someone who owns a building? Owen, do you have a thought on I, that? Yeah, oh, absolutely. That's my that's what I do every day. Uh, <laughs> that's so your I, day yeah, job. I have lots yes. of thoughts about it. So look, I, I give you an example. You know, we all watched the major tech companies have these, and and, and others like WeWork have these amazing buildouts, right? The great amenities in the space, great offerings for employees like food and other things, and a lot of people scratched their head at that. But they were all at that time dealing with a mobile workforce that was able to work from anywhere. Uh, because they were much more technology enabled. So now it's the whole world because we've been through a pandemic and every worker, every office worker and every industry's experienced work from home. And every business leader that I've talked to is very anxious to get their employees back to work. Um, they think it's critical for their success over the long term. This Jamie Dimon example is a, a really good one. So they're thinking, okay, what the, the key for me to be successful over the next six to 12 months, if not longer, is to successfully get my workforce back to the way, at least in some ways, the way it was. And so how do I, how do, I do that? How do I make coming back to work a great experience? And I think there, we haven't seen a lot of changes in um, a lot of money being spent in changing the uh, interior workspace from customers, but I, my guess is we probably will. And, and landlords like us have a big role to play in this. Um, you know, we obviously can't do a whole lot with the locations of our buildings. Hopefully we chose wisely even before the pandemic, but clearly opening new amenities, food offerings, making sure you have health clubs and all these things uh, near your properties, I think are very, very important. We need to help our customers bring their employees back to work. That's the way we think about it. You know, the interesting thing is uh, when amenities started out, I think they were more about trying to bring, you know, recreational activities on site, you know, the proverbial foosball table. Um, I, I think now 
when I, I think of my own uh, customers and colleagues, food seems to me the number one amenity that people like right at yeah. the moment. That somehow or another, I, 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 I imagine that um, there's a kind of comfort in getting together, even if you're socially distanced, but knowing you could have a decent cup of coffee or a snack or whatever it is. So I think that is a changing nature of the amenities that people are looking for ownership, or again, depending on the scale of the company, or their own companies to provide. Um, and uh, that's been fascinating to me too. Um, uh, okay, so, uh, another question has come in. Is the open, uh, open plan office space over or are reports of its death premature? Oh, I'd love to answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I think it's a very interesting question because I would tell you when the pandemic first started, Again, and I speak to Owen all the time because I wear his BXP hat to run every day. So he, it reminds me of him every day. Um, and, um, and, and so the, the, um, uh, it was a big conversation about there's going to be more private offices and people are going to want to be more secluded. And as the pandemic wore on, uh, kind of interestingly, this whole thesis of actually sharing a desk uh, you know, sharing an uh, sharing a common area, it's, so the conversation's actually gone full 360 to an actual open office plan. Uh, today, you know, CEOs are talking about using, you know, being in an open office, uh, you know, when they're sitting with their people. So, because of the utilization pre-pandemic, which is another fact that people don't really appreciate, pre-pandemic office utilization was. So 65% of the people came in every day. And people plan for this, by the way. So there's nothing unique. And today, this whole thesis is, oh, maybe it'll be 50%. I probably think they're wrong. I think it goes back to 65%. But, but, but maybe I'm, I'm alone in this. But the fact remains is that you can utilize the space you know, from one customer to the next. And I think open plan, ironically, I would sort of sit back, has come back into play. And if you, you know, and I go to a lot of WeWorks and I'm very focused on our common areas because we've designed an amenity. We've created like a lobby of a hotel. It's got that hospitality feel to it. Uh, and I always thought, okay, those are going to be deserted. Uh, but they're the first places to actually fill up. One, because people actually feel the ventilation. Well, I don't know, but they feel the ventilation is better. They feel that because there's no clutter, it can be cleaned faster and better. Uh, and two, they like to see other people. Uh, and so there's a whole social aspect to it. And so, you know, again, you know, Citibank has come out and said publicly that effectively we're going to go to open plan offices. Uh, JP Morgan has done the same thing. So a lot of institutions have come back and she reversed their thought process, you know, from nine months ago. But I always say to people, whatever we learned at the beginning of the pandemic, change six months into the pandemic will change today. And I assure you a year from today, it'll be different again. The one thing is uncertainty. But as of right now, it seems to every people we speak to that open plan is becoming more the norm than not the norm. You know, I, I'm laughing at the changes. I think that um, we, we keep surveying people and we're surveying them sort of in the midst of the crisis. And I always say it's like asking a mother in a, the delivery room, uh, how many children do you want? I mean, it's pointless uh, to ask people questions while the crisis is still on. Look, we're coming to the end. And I have. I'd like to ask each of you to respond to this question because I'm sure the folks who are listening to the panel really are interested in knowing where each of you think the opportunities are in the midst of this. I just saw um, Steve Roth yesterday uh, at Vornado commented that he's disappointed that there are not enough distressed situations emerging uh, from I just wonder if each of you see in the midst of the changes, particular opportunities. Um, uh, why don't we start with you, Jim? Um, because I I'd love to hear what you think in terms of the capital markets there. Um, you know, I, as I just kind of referenced back some of my opening comments about markets that appear very accommodating for growth. We're seeing, um, you know, investors wanting to uh, wanting our clients to take take advantage of opportunity coming out of this and into the rebound trade. Um, so I'm very, very optimistic on opportunity in general. Defer to the other panelists on specific areas um, that they that they're seeing. Natalie, do you want to tell us where your thoughts are? Um, single family housing, US. 
life science india logistics um europe and asia and many other things. life science <laughs> in the, life science in, in india, india in particular yeah. Yeah, yeah why why uh why there uh, as a result of the terrible crisis that we're we're seeing no that, that, that right was now. already something that we 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 had a look at and um it's uh there is kind of a small sil silicon valley dedicated or a, another uh, Boston Cambridge thing in, in, in India, which is very interesting because it's uh, it's very close to what we used to do in terms of offices, but it's kind of diversification in terms of tenant risk. So we like that very much. And we, we do other uh, life science, uh, we do life science with, uh, with Blackstone. Uh, so we started with, with them, but we, we have made some of deals around the world and, uh, and it, it does lead us to, to India. So I, I was just trying to really uh, um, pick among the different things that we are looking at. Of course, there are some other things, but those things are, I think, uh, of interest uh, for us right now. You know, one of the things I'm observing in our own market, because it seems to me that it, life science is such a ripe opportunity, but it also has become in an instant the answer to every question. I, I have to tell you, I have the most ridiculous conversations on a weekly basis with people who wanna insert life science right into the middle of whatever other project they're doing. And I, I think that it's certainly, at least I can tell you in New York, I can't speak uh, globally, we've gotten a little bit ahead of where life science itself is, even though obviously uh, we've been beneficiaries of uh, the immense growth uh, in intellectual capital that's happening in that sector. But I'm fascinated that India is a particular area of interest uh, for you. Oh, and and less competition, to be honest there. <laughs> Yeah. Well, our, our um, scope is a little narrower than Nathalie's, but the um, we just launched three life science developments, uh, not in New York, uh, in suburban Boston and South San Francisco. Half the lab space in the country is in those two, uh, in Boston and San Francisco region. We think those are good opportunities. I would tell you too, they are starting. To, you're starting to see some non-core office real estate being sold by what I'd call non-traditional sellers. And, uh, and, and I think there's a market there. I think the office market is um, more liquidity is coming into it and more risk taking is gonna be happening. Uh, it's happening now. Sandy? Um, you know, I, you know the, the nice thing about being sort of now on the other side of the coin, which is kind of interesting to me, uh, then you know, then you know, I, I look at things a little differently. Um, and you asked, where is the distress or where there's opportunity? And you know, it's ironic. I've been talking to a company which is a which is a technology company. It's called Reef Technologies. But if you think how they've invested, which is really a real estate play, and they're using it on a technology platform, if they're buying parking lots and using parking lots for ghost kitchens, things we don't talk about, uh, you know, for uh, uh, you know, for actual parking, uh, which, you know, uh, you know, they're using it for, uh, you know, satellite offices. So I, I think, you know, we all tend to look for things in, 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 in normal places. And I think uh, there is, there is, there are opportunities, not normal places. I mean, there are 4,500 parking lots in America, like in 400 cities. Uh, so I, I, I'm always sort of sit back and say, you know, where, what can be disrupted next? What's the next thematic uh, out there? Because I don't think the, 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 the point is you should buy dis things in distress, uh, that you should buy things that have a thematic that can actually have growth. Uh, and if you think about John Gray, he paid full price for logistics, full price, right? He never tried to, you know, buy it inexpensively. So I, I think the, the concept of I'm going to buy something in distress was to say I'm going to buy something that I see that there's going to be growth. I think there's a there's a difference, and I, I'm a much bigger believer, you know, that you see where there's going to be growth and invest in the growth uh, at market pricing. If your thing is life sciences, it's going to continue to grow. You're not going to find it in distress, but the growth is going to outweigh what you pay for it. So you really have to think about growth and disruption more than you have to think about distress. I'm sorry to interrupt such a uh, rich and engaging discussion, but I have to stop you there because we've, uh, we're have we at the end of our event and I want to respect everyone's time. 
Uh, from start to finish, this has been a rich discussion of our industry, our broader economy, and uh, a sharing of the opinions of our amazing experts on this unique set of circumstances under which we're all living and working in 2021. So I want to thank all of our panelists for participating and Mary Ann for moderating and contributing her own perspective. Uh, we really appreciate your insights and in particular your, your candor in, in an uncertain time. Um, and thanks also again to our keynote speakers, David Rubenstein and Jonathan Gray. Uh, we certainly face challenges, uh, but I'm optimistic based on both the LA Piper's uh, survey results and today's discussions. And one of the last thing I'd like to note is that as an expression of our appreciation for all of our panelists, DLA Piper will be making donations to the Capital Area Food Bank, to City Harvest Rescuing Food for New York City, and to Moisson Montreal. And in closing, I know that all of us have attended many virtual meetings over the last 14 months, and this one in particular has been excellent, but I for one am looking forward to resuming in-person meetings. Heard a lot of the reasons why over the last hour. Uh, and to collaboration. So I will remind all of you that DLA Piper will reconvene our real estate summit in May of next year in person. And we look forward to seeing many of you then and in person. Uh, and with that, thank you again for attending and have a great remainder of your day. This concludes today's presentation. On behalf of the presenters and DLA Piper, thank you for joining.